Hello everyone, welcome to the last part of my analysis of the story of Owl's Moving Castle. We are finally at the final stretch. I didn't expect this study to end up being so long, nor that it would be so much work, but we have reached the end for all intents and purposes. If I look a little bit stiff today, it's because I woke up with really bad neck pain. I should be on a neck brace actually, but I wouldn't record with that thing on my neck, obviously. For those of you who are new here, allow me to explain what this and the previous videos consist of. In this five-part review, I compare the events that take place in the movie Owl's Moving Castle with the events that take place in the book of the same name. Yes, the movie is based on a book, written by a British author. I draw attention to details that may have gone unnoticed when you saw the movie, point out references to other works, clarify the origin of certain details, such as the sets or the music, explain symbols, talk about prequels and sequels, and much more. If you had doubts about something when you saw the movie, you'll probably find the answer somewhere in one of these videos. In the last video, we analyzed Sophie's trip to the palace and her attempt to tarnish Al's name, which in the film happens because Al doesn't want to be recruited to fight in the war, and in the book because he doesn't want to help the king find his brother Justin. In the book, Sophie's words actually convince the king that Al is the right person for the job, and Al ends up appointed royal sorcerer. In the movie, it turns out that the invitation to the palace was a trap set by Suleiman, Al's former mentor. But when circumstances begin to deteriorate, Al himself appears to rescue Sophie. Let's first talk about what happens next in the book. Again, if you're only interested in the events of the movie, skip to the moment indicated on the screen. So, if you remember, in the book, Al's former teacher is not Suleiman, but an imposing woman called Mirsi Spenstemon, who, on the day Sophie went to the palace for her audience with the king, was murdered by the Witch of the Waste for refusing to confess where all was. All wants to attend Mirsi Spenstemon's funeral, but he knows that the witch is looking for him, so a plan has to be devised. In the meantime, Sophie notices that All is spending lots of time in Wales and suspects that he is seeing Miss Angorian, which makes her very jealous. So when All complains that he has caught a cold because of the damp climate in the Wales, Sophie shows no sympathy. I was thinking that people who run away from everything deserve all the colds they get, she replies. People who are appointed to do something for the king and instead go courting in the rain have only themselves to blame. This chapter shows why Books All is, so is such a beloved character among readers. Because, let's face it, you, you often can't help but identify with him. With the king's order hanging over his head and the witch of the waste on his trail, All decides to move the heart of the castle from Port Avon to market shipping, and Michael is tasked with visiting the site to prepare for the move. As an extra security measure, he puts on a magical cloak that transforms him into a man with a red beard. This cape certainly served as inspiration for the one Markel wears in the movie when he attends to the customers. While Michael is in market shipping and all is sick in bed, Sophie realizes that someone is trying to get into the castle and, unable to contain her curiosity, opens the door, not without putting on one of the magic cloaks which turns her into a horse, which Calcifer finds hilarious. On the other side of the door is a used greyhound. With great effort, the dog manages to take a human form, just long enough to explain that he has come from upper folding and let Atletis be hest, and asks Sophie to not tell all anything. After saying the words, the pale, red-headed man becomes a dog again, this time a red setter. When all comes face to face with the dog, Sophie keeps it a secret and just say that it's her new dog. She also notices that the dog does everything to prevent her from getting close to all, acting like a real guard dog. When Michael returns from market shipping, he announces that he has found a new location for the castle, a head store that is for sale. Sophie realizes it's the same store where she spent her childhood. When the day of Mrs. Penstemon's funeral arrives, all comes out of the bedroom dressed all in black, from his suit to his boots and even his hair, a tribute to his student days. Then all disappears and in his place stands a red setter. This is the disguise he uses to attend the funeral. 
However, things don't go according to plan. Going to the funeral leads the witch of the ways to find him, and the fight breaks out. Sophie watches as Calcifer roars and climbs the chimney, all blinding flame. It then transforms into a dozen faces, which pulsate in colors ranging from deep blue to white. One moment it appears with multiple orange eyes, and the next with a series of starry silver eyes. Sophie has never seen anything like it. At some point, watching the fight through Calcifer isn't enough, and she and Michael go out to Port Avon to watch the real conflict. The furious magic had disturbed the sea and the ships. Several wet, slippery look looking ladies, with greenish brown hair and tails instead of legs, are dragging themselves towards the shore. They are mermaids, and Sophie remembers the curse that was placed on Owl. Only two things remain to happen the Mandrake having a child, and the wind advancing an honest mind. The Witch of the Waste escapes, and Owl returns to the castle in the form of a cat. Let's focus a little on the movie now, because the next chapter of the book refers to the transformation that the castle undergoes when all moves, moves its core, and the two narratives are very similar in this part. The night Sophie returns from the King's Palace, she has a nightmare. In it, Sophie hears all coming, semi-invisible, leaving bloody bird footprints on the wooden floor. She enters All's room, which is now a cave full of memorabilia and children's toys, representing All's childhood. Despite the change from bedroom to cave, this dreamlike place still bears some resemblance to All's real bedroom, which is also full of shiny objects. It should be noted that All's bestial form is a huge black bird, and that some birds are known for collecting all sorts of random, sometimes shiny, trinkets to build their nests. In the book, All doesn't turn into a bird, but at one point Sophie compares the wizard's room to a nest. The cave splits in two, and at the end of one of the two tunnels, the left one, she finds all completely transformed into a monstrous bird. I haven't found any theories about what the two tunnels symbolize, but it could be as simple as all's future can take two pets, he can become a man, or he can become a monster. When wizards become monsters, they even forget that they were once human. Sophie tells these no longer human all that she wants to help, but it's too late. When she wakes up, Calcifer confirms that all's time is coming to an end. If Sophie doesn't break the contract, all will be consumed by his demon. And just like in the book, all decides to move the heart of the castle from Port Avon to market shipping. To do this, he uses white paint to draw a huge symbol on the lawn, where he directs the castle, and Shulk to draw a smaller symbol inside. The smaller symbol is reminiscent of a sundial and contains the letter Phi, a constant that represents the golden ratio. The larger symbol, on the other hand, is much more mysterious. No matter how hard I looked, I couldn't find anything that even resembled it. To make up for this, here's a little trivia. Did you know that in alchemy, the triangle pointing upwards represents the element of fire? Once the preparations are complete, all carefully removes Calcifer from the fireplace with a shovel and uses his power to completely transform the castle. In no other scene does the Calcifer in the movie look so much like the Calcifer in the book. The change takes place in almost the same way in the book, except that the tension is a little more palpable. After all, this is a process that could kill Calcifer. And instead of the two symbols, Ol and Michael mark each corner of the castle with Shulk and draw a five-pointed star in the center contained in a circle. Obviously, even with this brief description and without any images, we know that this is a pentagram. Just like the one that I have in my hearings. The pentagram is probably the most famous symbol related to magic and the occult. Its meaning has varied greatly over time, protection, perfection, the devil, among others. Mathematically, the segments of the pentagram exhibit the, old, the golden ratio, which connects this symbol to the one shown in the movie, even though they are so different. After the change, in the film, the door features a mechanism with colors yellow, red, green and black. The yellow one replaced the old blue one, which led to Port Avon, and is the one linked to the head store in Market Sipping. The green and black colors are still linked to the same places as before. The red one, on the other hand, instead of being linked to Kingsbury, is now linked to a huge garden full of flowers of all kinds, interspersed with beautiful lakes. All calls it his secret garden, an inheritance from his wizard uncle, and claims that it is a gift for Sophie. 
It was here that in the past all caught Calcifer when he fell from the sky, an event that Sophie observed. That's why the place seems familiar to her. Of course, at this point in the story, Sophie hasn't traveled back in time, but she was there when all caught the shooting star. She was there because of the actions she will soon take. It's a real paradox. In this universe, it seems a person retains subconsciously all memories from the past, even if those memories are acquired by their future self. Let's see an example. Let's say child me is sleeping on a bed and that my future self comes back in time and starts roaming the dark streets at that moment. Then she stops to pet a cat. In that moment, that memory would connect with child me, the one on the bed. So if child me were to see the cat the next day, it would feel familiar to her. This is very atypical for time travel fiction, by the way. It's not generally how it works. I can see it getting messy real fast, so it's good Miyazaki didn't dwell on this time travel thing too much. All explains to Sophie that he is making all these preparations so that she and the others can live comfortably, and suggests that Sophie open a flower store, since there are flowers everywhere in the garden. Again, this is a clever reference to the book, where Sophie and All actually remodel the art store and turn it into a flower store. The color mechanism in the book changes more than in the film. The blue section is painted yellow and is linked to the head store in market shipping, the green section is painted purple and is linked to the flower garden, which is located right on the edge of the waist, and the red section is painted orange and linked to a mansion in a place called Vale End, which is in the same valley as market shipping. All bleaches his hair again and he turns snow white. While all is locked in the bedroom, Sophie talks to Calcifer. Seeing him during all's fight, with the witch reminded her reminded her of a star. She discovered the secrets behind the contract. When all takes her on a tour through the new space, Sophie is a bit grumpy, because seeing her old house gives her mixed feelings. Curiously, we can also see Sophie's inner conflict in the movie. All feels hurt that his efforts to please Sophie are not being appreciated, but then he shows her the garden, which Sophie describes as truly wonderful. While they are in the garden, Al explains that it was created by the wizard Suleiman a year ago. Sophie suspects that Al has moved the castle so close to the waist because he actually intends to find Prince Zestin, but Al gracefully escapes when Sophie tries to inquire about it. Sophie starts selling flowers. Al's presence makes the business go very smoothly. She also starts talking to said flowers to motivate them to grow and change their shapes. One day, she collects some roots from a blue rose bush and puts them in the ground, and they produce many different plants, including a mysterious species with pointed spotted leaves and a long stem with a flower bud. Accidentally, Sophie has created a mandrake. One more impossible event and which of the ways will be able to take possession of all's art. In the meantime, the dogman manages to return to his original form long enough to reveal to Sophie that it was he who was with the witch on the night she cast her spell. He was the pale page whom the witch called Gaston. Shortly afterwards, the caster receives an unexpected visitor. Out of the blackness that hides well comes Miss Angorian. Please, asks Miss Angorian, don't tell Mir Jenkins that I was here. To tell you the truth, I wholly encouraged him in the hopes of in hopes of getting news of my fiancé, Ben Sullivan. She then sees a guitar and, and runs to pick it up. Ben had a guitar like this, it could be Ben's. Sophie ponders whether she should or tell Miss Angorian that there is a witch who killed her fiancé. Jealousy get, gets the better of her, however, and Sophie ends up kicking Miss Angorian out of the castle unbashedly, despite feeling guilty about it later. The dog man can keep his true identity a secret for long, as his form changes constantly Al soon notices that instead of a red setter, Sophie now has an English sheepdog. Sophie, Al exclaims angrily when the realization eats him. What did you intend by not telling me? This dog is a man and is in a terrible state. Forcibly placed in front of Calcifer, he is examined by the demon, who explains that this man is incomplete and has parts of another man. Al manages to remove the part of the spell that forces the man to take on a cannon skin. As he can remember who he is, they decide to call him Percival. It should be noted that Percival is one of the knights of the round table, and that Pendragon, one of the names all uses as a pseudonym, is an epithet associated with Uther, King Arthur's father. 
The title Pendragon literally means Chief of the Dragons. The Knights of the Round Table, on the other hand, according to legend, were the men awarded the, awarded the highest order of chivalry at the court of the mythical King Arthur. The round table around which they gathered was created in this shape so that it has no head, representing the equality of all its members. Sufi's very name, Ether, is a double pun, an allusion to her job at the beginning of the story, making Eth, and a reference to Alice in Wonderland, as all confirmed somewhere during chapter 12 when he says to Sophie, we can't all be mad eaters. Sophie, in a bad mood, starts watering the weeds around the mansion in Vale End with herbicide. Percival keeps her company. The dogman starts talking about the time he lived in Mrs. Fairfax's house with Letty. They were both very nice to me, says Percival, even though they had never seen me before. And Wizard All kept visiting the house to court Letty. Letty didn't want him and asked me to bite him to get rid of him until all suddenly started asking questions about you. He said, I know someone called Sophie who looks a bit like you. And Letty said, that's my sister, without thinking. And she was terribly worried at the time. The day you arrived, she was being nice to all to find out how he knew you. All said that you were now an old woman. And Mrs. Fairfax said she had seen you. Letty cried and cried. She said, something terrible has happened to Sophie. And the worst thing is that she will think she is safe from all. And she was so upset that I managed to turn into a man long enough to say that I was going to keep an eye on you. That's very kind of her, but I don't need a watchdog. Yes, you do, Percival countered. Or you did, I was too late. Sophie, annoyed by the remark, almost eats Percival with weed killer. She drops the steaming watering can in the middle of the pet and marches through the weeds. And yet, in the end, she comes to the conclusion that Percival is right. When she returns to the castle, Sophie realizes that Ol and Michael have been spying on her conversation with Percival. Ol knows that Sophie is under a curse, but this is something he has known for a long time. There was a time when everyone seemed to be telling me. I tried several times to get it off you when you weren't looking, but nothing seemed to work. I've come to the conclusion that you like being in disguise. Let's go back to the film for a moment, more precisely to the scene in which Fanny, who let me remind you is Sophie's mother in the film, not her stepmother, arrives at the former Ed store in a vehicle and, on seeing Sophie, immediately recognizes her and throws herself into her arms, crying and saying that she has been looking for her everywhere. It would be a touching moment, but the question that immediately comes to viewers' minds is why isn't Fanny surprised to see Sophie as an old woman? It's because this visit is actually a trap set by Suleiman, so that she can insert a spy into the castle. The Witch of the Waste finds this spy by opening a bag that Fanny left behind on purpose. The creature that the witch removes from the bag and kills by throwing it into Calcifer's mouth is very similar to one that appeared in the movie Spirited Away. It's the black slug that, in the movie, Yubaba has put inside Aku to control him, the one that Shiru steps on in Kamaji's workshop. The fact that Suleiman has sent a spy shows that Inn is no longer working for the sorceress, which is confirmed at the end of the movie, the only moment when Inn actually contacts Suleiman to show her that everything has been resolved. After ingesting the slug, Calcifer feels ill, and Sophie is unable to revive him, leaving the castle unprotected. Fanny's visit also occurs in the book. She doesn't come to see Sophie, she just wants to say hello to the new owners of the mansion at Val End. Fanny is wearing a cream silk hat adorned with roses, one of Sophie's creations. She charmed this hat by saying, you are going to have to marry money. And so Fanny did. She married a rich man, which is also mentioned in the movie. After a brief conversation with Sophie, Fanny eventually recognizes her. Sophie C exclaims, oh my god child, what's happened to you? You look almost 90. In the book, the reunion is truly moving, there is no setup involved. Fanny and Sophie cry in each other's arms. You must not worry, because Wizard All has taken me in, Sophie explains. Wizard All, Fanny exclaims, that wicked man, did he do this to you? Where is he? Take me to him. Fanny's posture is so warlike that Sophie decides to take the parasol out of her hand and Aris to correct the misunderstanding. Shortly afterwards, Michael arrives, carrying Martha by the hand. The spell is fading, and she seems almost like herself again. 
The meeting is complete with Le when Letty and Mrs. Fairfax appear at the door, accompanied by Percival, who is more cheerful than usual. What seems like a succession of happy coincidences was actually orchestrated by Hall, who wanted to reunite Sophie with her family. But this exciting moment is interrupted by the arrival of Miss Sangorian. Oh, excuse me, I've come at a bad time, haven't I? She says. I just wanted to talk to Owl. Michael explains that Owl is asleep and invites her to take a glass of wine. Only the promised glass of wine never comes, because in the meantime, Calcifer stands up and roars. All, Owl Jenkins, to which has found your sister's family. All wastes no time in coming to the rescue of Mary, Nail, and Megan. In Owl's bedroom, there is a window overlooking his sister's house in Wales, and it is through this window that Sophie and the readers see what is happening. To which is leaning against, against the swing, tall and imposing, and calls out to the children and Megan, who are unable to resist the witch's power, and walk towards her. All birds onto the lawn, and the witch flees. She goes over the fence in a flurry of fire-colored robes, with all on her trail, and the fence hides them both from view. As all shades the witch, or what he thinks he is the witch, the scarecrow reappears. This time, instead of trying to force his way in, he waits calmly at the door and tries to communicate with Calcifer. The thing is talking, says Calcifer to Sophie. It's saying it doesn't mean any harm. I think it's telling the truth. It's waiting for your permission to enter. The scarecrow has always terrified her, but Sophie decides to trust Calcifer's judgement and lets him in. Immediately, the scarecrow asks for the skull, the one that all bought along with the guitar and used to decorate the castle, and throws himself head first onto it. The skull merges with the scarecrow's turnip head. Now I can talk, says the scarecrow. This is one of the parts I was told to find. He turns to Sophie. I have to thank you. My skull was too far away and I ran out of strength before I reached it. I would have lain in that edge forever if you hadn't brought me back to life. The scarecrow runs off, leaving much to be clarified, and the voice of the Witch of the Waste resounds through the castle, amplified. She taunts all, says that he has fallen into a trap, and that Miss Angorian is now locked away in her fortress in the Waste. Sophie mourns. She feels guilty for not having received Miss Angorian more kindly, which led to her leaving the castle and being kidnapped. To try to make amends, Sophie puts the Seven League Boots and sets off for the witch's fortress. The problem is that Miss Angorian has never been kidnapped, the witch's target has always been Sophie, and in her haste to make things right, Sophie went into the wolf's mouth. The witch turns her page boys into orange sticky monsters, which immobilize our protagonist. She saw Sophie a throne on which a headless man is sitting. This body belongs to Prince Zestin. I sold Wizard Suleiman's skull along with his guitar, explains the witch. Prince Zestin's head is out there somewhere with the other parts that are left over. This body is a perfect blend of Prince Zestin and Wizard Suleiman. It's waiting for Owl's head to become the perfect human. As the witch predicted, Owl has come to save Sophie, but he is not alone. The Scarecrow also has a score to settle with the witch, and, two against one, she is beaten. At the end of the fight, the Scarecrow reveals that he is an entity created by the sorcerer Suleiman, in his moment of despair, but that he arrived too late to save him, and has been collecting his scattered parts ever since. The revelations don't end there. Not only has Miss Angorian not been kidnapped, she is not who she appears to be. She is actually a fire demon, the one who was in, con in a contract with the Witch of the Waste. And because she touched an object inside the castle, Suleiman's guitar, she was able to pretend to leave, when in fact she never did. She only hid inside the guitar. All blows the wind up and races Sophie through the air. During the flight, he admits that he always intended to save the prince. Why did you pretend to run away, to fool the witch? Sophie asks. I'm a coward. In order to do something so scary, I had to tell myself I wasn't doing it. All shouts in response, to make himself heard over the roar of the wind. With this, the last term of the curse is fulfilled. A wind to advance an honest mind. So, when Owl and Sophie arrive at the castle, Miss Sangorian is standing in front of the fireplace, holding Calcifer in her hands. Miss Sangorian intends to use it to control Owl. When she squeezes it, Owl falls to the ground unconscious. For the first time, Sophie then uses her powers consciously. 
She raises her cane and orders it. Eat Miss Sangorian, but don't hurt anyone else. Miss Sangorian ends up dropping Calcifer, and before she can step on him, Sophie retrieves him from, from the ground. She can feel all's heart beating faintly. Calcifer, I'm going to have to break your contract. Will it kill you? Sophie asks, just like in the movie. Yes, if someone else did it, Calcifer replies. But you can bring things to life. And this is the reason why Sophie in the book manages to break the contract and save Calcifer. It has to do with her powers, her ability to breathe, thing, to breathe life into all things. She did it with the Scarecrow and with the cane too. Without this context, the equivalent scene in the movie becomes more difficult to understand. Why is Sophie able to do the same thing in the movie as she did in the books? That's where the theories come in. One very viable one is that that in the end, Sophie knows the whole truth about the contract. She even saw the moment when all gave Calcifer his art, and this knowledge of the truth is what allows her to separate Calcifer from all's art. Calcifer's it will be fine if you do it implies that both he and all knew that Sophie was the one who was fated to break the contract, because it was she who went to the past and offered them help. Others theorize that perhaps Sophie in in the film is also a witch, that perhaps she has the same powers as in the book, but this is simply not explored as much. There is some evidence behind this theory, but it's not conclusive enough for us to say for sure that Sophie in the movie also has powers. Sophie puts all's art in the right place, and Calcifer gets loose and overs by her shoulder in the form of a blue tear. I feel so light, I'm free, he shouts. Else did, says All as he wakes up. I've got a hangover. No, you hit your head on the floor, replies Sophie. Meanwhile, the, be the bewitched Kane continues to eat Miss Angorian, but it's now on fire. The demon tries to use this to her advantage. She intends to set fire to the scarecrow, which is blocking the door. All puts a stop to it by crushing the witch's heart, and Miss Angorian fades away. With that, what was in the wrong place is in the right place again. The sorcerer Suleiman and Prince Zestin greet each other warmly, back in their respective bodies. Then the sorcerer Suleiman approaches Letty and offers to be her tutor. In the midst of absolute chaos, All and Sophie only have eyes for each other. Sophie has regained her youth. Calcifer's back, warns Michael, which attracts the attention of All and Sophie. A familiar blue face flickers in the fireplace. The book ends with Calcifer saying, it's raining outside in market shipping, a phrase almost identical to the one in the book, in which he says, it looks like it's going to rain. The ending of the movie, despite the small similarities, is almost entirely different from that of the book. The conclusion is not about a confrontation with the Witch of the Waste and her demon, but is instead related to the war. From the outset, all is depicted as having an anti-war stance, but it demonstrates this stance by fighting indiscriminately against the forces of each side, at the cost of his humanity, despite Calcifer's warnings. When seen that highlights All's view on the war is when he and Sophie spot a military plane loaded with bombs and Sophie asks, is it ours or the enemy's? And All replies, what difference does it make? Murderers. But at the end of the movie, All is no longer fighting without a purpose, because now he has someone he wants to protect. To save All, Sophie decides to make a drastic decision. She shovels Calcifer out of the fireplace and leaves the castle. Even before she does, you can see that the castle is already decaying as a result of All's condition, as he is fighting to protect market shipping from bombing. For those who were confused during this scene, Sophie took Calcifer out of the castle in order to sever his connection to the head store in market shipping. No one, not her or even Calcifer, knew exactly what was going to happen. The result was the total collapse of the castle. But Sophie got what she wanted. When the castle reappears, smaller and lighter, it is free of all its ties. It is not bound to market shipping or to Port Haven or to any other physical location. And now her intention is to take the castle to all and show him that there is no longer any reason for him to continue fighting, that they can all run away. But something goes wrong. The Witch of the Waste discovers that Calcifer has all's art and, still obsessed, she grabs him and refuses to let go, even 
as calcifer's flames begin to burn her alive. In fact, it is possible that the witch doesn't really understand the gravity of the situation, that she doesn't understand that she is dying. It's clear that she is suffering from dementia, and there are times when she acts and speaks lucidly, and times when she doesn't seem to understand what's happening around her. When Sophie throws a bucket of water over Calcifer, saving her life, the witch, instead of being grateful, cries, still clinging to what's left of Calcifer, like a child after someone tried to take away their toy. In her mind, it, all's art, belongs to her, and Sophie was trying to steal it from her. With Calcifer on the brink of death, the castle crumbles completely, leading part of the ruins and Sophie to fall into a ravine. She cries, thinking that her act of saving the witch has led to the death of Calcifer and all, but at that moment the ring begins to glow, proof that they are both still alive and trying to guide her with the rest of their strength. The ring leads Sophie to what used to be the castle door, which is now partially buried in rubble. There is now only one color, black. Sophie plunges into darkness and is taken to the past, to the moment when all catches Calcifer and gives him his heart so that he can survive. I have already talked about this scene so much in the previous videos that I don't think it's necessary to go into detail again. I just want to draw attention to the moment when the ground starts trying to swallow Sophie. This is proof of how unstable all's condition is. Moments later, the ring breaks and the floor opens up. All and Calcifer can keep her in the past for long, but it was enough for Sophie to connect the dots and get to the truth. As she falls to the present, Sophie shouts, All, Calcifer, it's me, Sophie, wait for me, I promise I'll come back for you, wait for me in the future. And since then, All has been looking for her, because he saw her at that moment. It should be noted that in the meantime, perhaps without even realizing it, since there were more important things at stake, Sophie has broken the curse that she was under. Her insecurities and doubts no longer matter because the life of the person she loves is in danger. So, for some time now, she has returned to her true self, to the young woman she was. Only her hair has remained white. And you might ask, why did it all take Sophie to the past before, if that's all it took? The answer to that has to do with the paradox of time travel. Sophie looks a certain way when she is in the past. All sees this young woman, with short white hair that looks like starlight, proclaiming that she will help them. All these physical characteristics are clues to, as to when Sophie will be sent to the past. If she was sent there before, the scene wouldn't be the same. If she had been sent there at the wrong time, who knows what could have happened. And even sending Sophie there in the first place was a risk. All and Calcifer were at their limit, so they figured it that must have been the moment. All is waiting for Sophie among the rubble, almost in the most ruinous form she saw in her nightmare, wounded and trembling. It takes her to what remains of the castle, a patch of floor that walks on metal bird legs, where the scarecrow, Markle and the witch of the way still remain, the later two curled up on themselves, sheltering from the cold. All reverts to human form as he falls into unconsciousness, but Sophie now knows what to do. She walks over to the Witch of the Waste and kindly convinces her to part with the wizard's art. The scene in which Sophie gives all back his art and frees Calcifer is very similar to the one in the book, despite the different contexts, with phrases appearing in both media, such as My Calcifer live a thousand years or I'm free. It's at this point that Miyazaki also decides to play with the concept of fairy tales, or rather their inversion. Which, mind you, is something that Jones has already done many times during the novel. With Calcifer's disappearance, what's left of the castle is destroyed, which would kill everyone if it weren't for the actions of Turnip Ed, who intervenes to save them, suffering damage in the process. Moved, Sophie thanks him with a kiss, and the Scarecrow turns into a prince. This prince is not a prince Justin from the book, but the prince of a neighboring country of Hungary who was cursed, we don't know why or by whom, to wander around as a scarecrow until he received a kiss of true love. In fairy tales, what follows is that a prince marries the protagonist from humble origins and they both live happily ever after. But this doesn't happen in All's Moving Castle, because Sophie and All are already in love. This doesn't mean that Sophie and the prince can't be soulmates, 
or that a kiss wasn't true love, but that but there are different kinds of love. The prince accepts the rejection with dignity, but adds that he will return eventually if Sophie changes her mind. Finally, in contact Suleiman to show her that all the characters have managed to solve their problems. A happy ending, I see, comments Suleiman, unimpressed. The fourth wall is almost broken with his comment, in which the sorceress acknowledges that the structure of the film is, in fact, that of a fairy tale. Suleiman is a very interesting character, in the sense that she seems to possess a certain omniscience. Without a doubt, Suleiman is the most powerful character in the movie. And yet, while she recognizes that the war in question started for stupid reasons, she has done nothing to try to stop it or to uncover the truth behind the prince's disappearance. That disappearance being the event that triggered the war. This might reflect Miyazaki's desire to show that conflicts in the real world are also partly arbitrary and fed by the wills and whims of people in high positions, who, instead of using the power they have to solve the causes behind the dissent, use it instead to foment even more disagreements. Even so, we can see Suleiman's final act, summoning the ministers to begin peace negotiations, as a small redemption. And the war ends just like that? Yes, and it is this is that is possibly the crux of the matter. It was a stupid war that could have been prevented. That's the whole point. Suleiman is certainly also happy that Al manages to break the contract with Calcifer, otherwise all who have lost is humanity. As we saw in the previous video, the sorceress is very fond of her favorite student. And given her less aggressive stance, perhaps she has even realized that Al's art belongs to no one but himself and that she has no right to control him and restrict his freedom. Calcifer, meanwhile, decides to return, and from his contribution, a new castle is born, one that flies instead of walking. What binds him to the castle now is not a contract, but the bonds of friendship he has with everyone. The movie ends with the castle flying through the clouds and over the sea, to the sound of the beautiful song Sekai no Yakuzoku, sung by Shie Kobaishu. But why did Miyazaki change the ending of the story so much? Those of you who have seen all the videos so far and have been paying attention probably already know the answer. Frankly, Miyazaki hates villains. He hates the very idea of the archetype of the villain. And John's book ends with a confrontation between the protagonists and the truly villainous character. It would be very and miyazaki like if he had followed this narrative and included it in this movie. Instead, he replaces the climax of the book with a sequence of anticlimactic events related to the themes he, he previously introduced – war, time travel, compassion and sacrifice. It's an unusual ending that leaves a lot unexplained. The experience also changes depending on whether or not you have read the book. And after hearing me talk about it for so long, perhaps it all makes more sense to you now. But perhaps you're of the opinion that a good movie shouldn't require you to go above and beyond to understand and appreciate it. I admit, and this might be an unpopular opinion, but I think I prefer Miyazaki's ending to Jones. I, I love it when something can be understood completely without context. As for which version of the story I prefer as a whole, it's hard to say. When it comes to the relationship between Ol and Sophie, there is no doubt that I prefer the one portrayed in the book. It's much more spontaneous and fun, and Ol's character is hilarious in itself. Finally, I want to end with some speculation about what happens after the last scene of the movie. In the first video, I said that Ol's Moving Castle was the first book in a trilogy. The other two are called, are called Castle in the Air and House of Many Ways. Thanks to the next two books in the series, we learn that as a reward for saving Prince Justin and Wizard Suleiman, Ol has been officially appointed royal wizard, and that Letty has married Suleiman. Sophie also becomes a more powerful witch than in the first book. She and Letty train alongside their husbands to perfect the art. Sophie becomes so capable that she is even sometimes interested with magical business when all is unavailable. However, there is no reason to believe that any of these things would happen in a sequel to the movie. After what happened in the palace, Al must want nothing more than to distance himself from royal affairs. 
and the wizard Suleiman doesn't even exist in the movie, so it would be impossible for him to marry Letty. Something the fans of the movie might be interested to know, however, is that Sophie and all had a son, whom they named Morgan. Morgan is a very gifted child and also has magical powers. In the book, we see him summoning toys out of thin air and filling the castle with them. In Castle in the Air, Calcifer, all Sophie and the newborn Morgan experience a great adventure in the form of, respectively, a magic carpet, a genie in a lamp, a black cat and a baby kitten. This is because of a curse that is placed on them and it is up to the protagonist of Castle in the Air, Abdullah, to break this curse, which eventually happens at the end of the story. It wouldn't be surprising if, in a sequel to the movie, all Sophie and Calcifer found themselves involved in more chaotic situations involving curses like this. The birth of their son Morgan would also be a strong possibility. And it's with these curiosities that I bid you farewell. I hope you enjoy learning more about the movie and I look forward to seeing you in future reviews, whether it be whether of anime or manga or even others. I haven't yet decided which anime or manga I'm going to talk about next. I have a few ideas, but I'm still in the process of deciding. I will let you know in the community tab when I make my choice. And don't forget that you can leave suggestions too. The next videos will be about Japanese history and mythology, so if you're interested in that, all you have to do is subscribe. Thanks for sticking with me to the end and I hope to see you soon.